Welcome back. Chapter eight. Uh, the end of chapter seven was Nathan Radley filling the knot hole with cement and Jem crying. Also, Jem asking Atticus about that tree, and obviously it wasn't dying, so he was just doing that just to be doing that, to be mean. Chapter eight. For reasons unfathomable to the experienced prophets in Macon County, autumn turned to winter that year. We had two weeks of the coldest weather since 1885, Atticus said. Mr. Avery said it was written on the Rosetta Stone that when children disobeyed their parents, smoked cigarettes, and made war on each other, the seasons would change. Jem and I were burdened with the guilt of contributing to the aber aberrations of nature, thereby causing unhappiness to our neighbors and discomfort to ourselves. So, pause. So it's winter, and Mr. Avery tells the children, Bad children like you make it like this. Mm -hmm. Old Mrs. Radley died that winter. Oh, now she died. But her death caused hardly a ripple. The neighborhood seldom saw her except when she watered her flowers. Jem and I decided that Boo had got her at last, but when Atticus returned from the Radley house, he said she died of natural causes to our disappointment. Ask him, Jem whispered. You ask him. You're the oldest. That's why you ought to ask him. Atticus, I said, did you see Mr. Arthur? Atticus looked sternly around his newspaper at me. I did not. Sternly around his newspaper. I did not. <laughs> Jem restrained me from further questions. He said Atticus was still touchy about us and the Radleys, and it wouldn't push him to do any. Wouldn't, and it wouldn't do to push him any. Jem had a notion that Atticus thought our activities that, ha, huh, Jem had a notion that Atticus thought our activities that night last summer were not solely confined to strip poker. Jem had no firm basis for his ideas. He said it was merely a twitch. So Jem's like, I think Atticus knows. Next morning, I awoke and looked out the window and nearly died of fright. My screams brought Atticus from his bathroom, half shaven. The world is ending, Atticus. Please do something. I dragged him to the window and pointed. No, it's not, he said. It's snowing. Jem asked Atticus, would it keep up? Jem had never seen snow either, but we knew what it was. Atticus said he didn't know any more about snow than Jem did. I think, though, if it's watery like that, it'll turn to rain. The telephone rang, and Atticus left the breakfast table to answer it. That was you, LeMay, he said when, when he returned. And I quote, as it has not snowed in Macon County since 1885, there will be no school today. Eula May was Megham's leading telephone operator. She was entrusted with, the, with issuing public announcements, wedding invitations, setting off the fire siren, and giving first aid instructions when Dr. Reynolds was away. When Atticus finally called us to order and bade us to look at our plates and set them out the windows, Jem asked, how do you make a snowman? Do you want to build? Sorry, I just, I could not resist that. Do you want to build? No. Okay. I haven't the slightest idea, said Atticus. I don't want y'all to be disappointed, but I doubt if there'll be enough snow for a snowball even. Calpurnia came in and she and said she thought it was sickening, stick, sticking. She, sticking. We ran to the backyard. It was covered with a feeble layer of soggy snow. We shouldn't walk about in it, said Jem. Look, every step you take is wasting it. I looked back at my mushy footprints. Jem said if we waited until it snowed some more, we could scrape it all up for a snowman. I stuck out my tongue and caught a fat flake. It burned. Jem, it's hot. No, it ain't. It's so cold it burns. Now don't eat it, Scout. You're wasting it. Let it come down. But I want to walk in it. I know what. I know what. We can go over and walk at Miss Maudie's. Jem hopped across the front yard. I followed in his tracks. When we were on the sidewalk in front of Miss Maudie's, Mr. Avery accosted us. He had a pink face and a big stomach below his belt. See what you've done, he said. Hasn't snowed and make him since the Apotomax. It's bad children like you that make the seasons change. I wonder if Mr. Avery knew how hopeful, hopefully we had watched last summer for him to repeat his performance, that's the peeing thing, and reflected that if this was our reward, there was something to say for sin. I did not wonder where Mr. Avery gathered his meteorolog meteorological statistics. They came straight from Rosetta Stone. Jim Finch, you Jim Finch? Miss Bonnie's calling you Jim. Y'all stay in the middle of the yard. There's some thrift buried underneath the snow near the porch. Don't step on it. Yes, um, called Jem. It's beautiful, ain't it, Miss Maudie? Beautiful, my hind foot. 
If it breezes tonight, it'll carry off and kill my azaleas. Miss Maudie's old sun hat glistened with snow crystals. She was bending over some small bushes, wrapping them in burlap bags. Jim asked her what she was doing that for. Keep them warm, she said. How can flowers keep warm? They don't circulate. I cannot answer that question, Jeremy Finch. All I know is if it freezes tonight, these plants will freeze. So you cover them up. Is that clear? Yes, I'm Miss Maudie. What, sir? Could Scout me borrow some of your snow? Heaven's alive. Take it off. There is an old peach basket under the house. Haul it off in that. Miss Maudie's eyes narrowed. Jim Finch, what are you going to do with my snow? You'll see, said Jim. And we transferred as much snow as we could from Miss Maudie's yard to ours. A slushy operation. What are we going to do, Jim? I asked. You'll see, he said. Now get the basket and haul all the snow you can break from the backyard to the front. Walk back in your tracks, though, he cautioned. Are we going to have a snow baby, Jim? That's Scout. No, a real snowman. Got to work hard. Got to work hard now. That's Jim's mentality, really. Always got to work hard. Always at it. Jim ran to the backyard, produced a garden hoe, and began digging quickly behind the woodpile placing any worms he found on one side. He went to the house and returned the laundry hamper, filled it with earth, and carried it to the front yard. We had five baskets of dirt and two baskets of snow. <laughs> Jem said we were ready to begin. Don't you think this is kind of a mess, I asked. Looks messy now, but it won't later, he said. Jem scooped up an armful of dirt and patted it into a mound, which he added another load and another until he constructed a torso. So he had a body built, a snowman body built out of dirt and mud. Jim, I ain't ever heard of a nigger snowman, I said. He won't be black long, he grunted. Jim procured some peach tree switches from the backyard, plated them, and bent them into bones to be covered with dirt. He looks like Stephanie Crawford with her hands on her hips, I said. Fat in the middle and little bitty arms. I'll make him bigger. Jem sloshed water over the mud man and added more dirt. He looked thoughtfully at it for a moment. Then he molded a big stomach below the figure's waistline. Jem glanced at me, his eyes twinkling. Mr. Avery's sort of shaped like a snowman, ain't he? Jem scooped up some snow and began plastering it on. He permitted me to cover only the back, saving the public parts for himself. Gradually, Mr. Avery turned white. Using bits of wood for eyes, nose, mouth, and buttons, Jim succeeded in mis making Mr. Avery look cross or angry. A stick of stove wood complemented the picture. Jim ste stepped back and viewed his creation. It's lovely, Jim, I said. It looks almost like he talked to you. It is, ain't it, he said shyly. We could not wait for Atticus to come home for dinner, but called and said we had a big surprise for him. He seemed surprised when he saw most of the backyard in the front yard, but he said we had done a Jim Dandy job. I didn't know how you were going to do it, he said to Jim, but from now on, I'll never worry about what'll become of you, son. You'll always have an idea. Jim's ears reddened from Atticus's, Atticus's compliment, but he looked, sharp, looked up sharply when he saw Atticus stepping back. First of all, Jim gets that compliment from his dad, and he's like, oh. And then Atticus steps back and he's looking at it and he's like, uh. Atticus squinted at the snowman a while. He grinned, then laughed. Son, I can't tell you what you're going to be, an engineer, a lawyer, or a portrait painter. You've got a, per you've got, you've perpetrated near libel here in the front yard. We've got to disguise this fellow. Basically, Atticus is saying, dude, he looks too much like Mr. Avery. We're going to, it's not going to go well. We got to fix it. Atticus suggested Jim hone down his creation front, creation's front a little, swap a broom for, a, for the stove wood and put an apron on him. Jim explained that if he did, the snowman would become muddy and cease to be a snowman. I don't care what you do so long as you do something, said Atticus. You can't go on around making caricatures of the neighbors. It ain't a caricature, Jim said. It just looks like him. Mr. Avery might not think so. I know what, said Jim. He raced across the street, disappeared into Miss Monty's backyard, and returned triumphant. He snuck her sun hat on the snowman's head and jammed her hedge clippers into the crook of his arm. Atticus said that would be fine. Miss Monty opened her front door and came out on the porch. She looked across the street at us. Suddenly she grinned. Jim French, she called. You little devil, bring me back my hat, sir. 
Jim looked up at Atticus, who shook his head. She's just fussing, he said. She's really impressed with your accomplishment. Atticus strolled over to Miss Maudie's sidewalk, where they engaged in an arm-waving conversation, the only phrase of which I caught was, erected an absolute morphinite in that yard. Atticus, you'll never raise them. The snow stopped that in the afternoon. The temperature dropped, and by nightfall, Mr. Avery's direst predictions came true. Calpurnia kept every fireplace in the house blazing, but we were still cold. When Atticus came home in the evening, he said we were in it. We were in for it, and asked Calpurnia if she wanted to stay with us for the night. Calpurnia glanced up at the high ceilings and long windows and said she thought she'd be warmer at her house. Atticus drove her home in the car. Before I went to sleep, Atticus put more, more coal on the fire in my room. Plus, they had fireplaces in rooms then to keep, there wasn't like central heat and air, so each room had a fireplace. He said the thermostat reg registered 16, that it was the coldest night in his memory, and that our snowman outside was frozen solid. Minutes later, it seemed, I was awakened by someone shaking me. Atticus's coat, overcoat was spread across me. Is it morning already? Baby, get up. Atticus was holding up my bathrobe and coat. Put your robe on first, he said. Jem was standing beside Atticus, groggy and tussled. He was holding his overcoat closed at the neck. His other hand was jammed into his pocket. He looked strangely overweight. Hurry on, said Atticus. Here's your shoes and socks. Stupidly, I put them on. Is it morning? No, it's a little after 1 a.m. Hurry now. That something was wrong finally got through to me. What's the matter? By then, he did not have to tell me. Just as the birds know where it goes when it rains, I knew there was some trouble on our street. Soft taffeta-like sounds and muffled scurrying sounds filled me with helpless dread. Whose is it? Miss Maudie's hon, said Atticus gently. At the front door, we saw fire spewing from Miss Maudie's dining room windows. As if to confirm what we saw, the town fire siren wailed up the scale to a treble pitch and remained there, screaming. It's gone, ain't it, moaned, At moaned Jem. I expect so, said Atticus. Now listen, both of you, go down and stand in front of the Radley place. Keep out of the way, do you hear? See which way the wind's blowing? Oh, said Jem. Atticus, reckon we ought to start moving our furniture out? Not yet, son. Do as I tell you. Run now. Take care of Scout, you hear? Don't let her out of your sight. With a push, Atticus started us toward the Radley front gate. We stood and watched the street fill with men and cars where, while fire silently devoured Miss Maudie's house. Why don't they hurry? Why don't they hurry? muttered Jem. We saw why. The old fire truck, killed by the cold, was being pushed from town by a crowd of men. When the men attached the hose to the hydrant, the hose burst and water shot up, tingling down on the pavement. Oh, Lord, Jem. Jem put his arm around me. Hush, Scout, he said. It ain't time to worry yet. I'll let you know when. Plus, you're going to hear this line a lot. It ain't time to worry yet. It's what Atticus says um, to comfort the kids. Like, it's not time to worry yet. We're not there yet. And you will see Jem uh, imitating Atticus and trying to be like him. The men of Maycomb, in all degrees of dress and undress, took furniture from Miss Maudie's house to a yard across the street. I saw Atticus carrying Miss Maudie's heavy oak, heavy oak rocking chair and thought it sensible of him to save what she valued most. Sometimes we heard shouts. Then Mr. Avery's face appeared in an upstairs window. He pushed a mattress out the window to the street and threw down furniture until the men shouted, Come down from there, Dick. The stairs are going. Get out of there, Mr. Avery. Mr. Avery began climbing through the window. Scout, he's stuck, breathed Jem. Oh, God. Mr. Avery was wedged tightly. I buried my head under Jem's arm and I didn't look again until Jem cried. He's got loose, Scout. He's all right. I looked up to see Mr. Avery cross the upstairs porch. He swung his legs over the railing and was sliding down a pillar when he slipped. He fell, yelled, and hit Miss Maudie's shrubbery. Suddenly, I noticed that the men were backing away from Miss Maudie's house, moving down the street toward us. They were no longer carrying furniture. The fire was well into the second floor and had eaten its way to the roof. Window frames were black against the vivid orange center. Jem, it looks like a pumpkin. Scout, look! Smoke was rolling off our house and Miss Rachel's house like a fog off a riverbank, and men were pulling hoses toward them. Behind us, the fire truck from Abbotsville screamed around a curve and stopped in front of our house. That book, I said. What? said Jem. 
That Tom Swift book. It ain't mine. It's Dill's. Don't worry, Scout. It's not time to be wor it's not time to worry yet, said Jem. He pointed. Look yonder. In a group of neighbors, Atticus was standing with his watch, hands in his overcoat pockets. He might have been watching a football game. Miss Maudie was beside him. See there, he's not worried yet, said Jem. Why ain't he on top of one of the houses? He's too old, said Jem. He'd break his neck. You think we ought to make make him get our stuff out? Let's don't pester him. He'll know when it's time, said Jem. <clears throat> the Abbotsville fire truck began pumping water on our, our house. A man on the roof pointed to places that needed it most. I watched our absolute morphodite snowman go black and crumble. Miss Maudie's sun hat settled on top of the heap. I could not see her hedge clippers. In the heap between our house and Miss Rachel's and Miss Maudie, in the heap between our house, Miss Rachel's and Miss Maudie's, the men had long ago shed coats and bathrobes. They worked in pajama tops and nightshirts, <clears throat> sucked into their pants. But I became aware that I was slowly freezing where I stood. Jem tried to keep me warm, but his arm was not enough. I pulled free of it and clutched my shoulders. By dancing a little, I could feel my feet. Another fire truck appeared and stopped in front of Miss Stephanie Crawford's. There was no hydrant for another hose, and the men tried to soak her house with hand extinguishers. Miss Maudie's tin roof quelled the flames. Roaring, the house collapsed. Fire gushed everywhere, followed by a flurry of blankets from men on top of the adjacent houses, beating out sparks and burning chunks of wood. It was dawn before the men began to leave, first one, one by one, then in groups. They pushed the Macon fire truck back to town. The Abbotsville truck departed. The third one remained. We found out the next day that it had come from Clark's Ferry, 60 miles away. Jem and I slid across the street. Miss Maudie was staring at the smoking black hole in her yard, and Atticus shook his head to tell us she did not want to talk. He led us home, holding on to our shutters, our shoulders, to cross the icy street. He said Miss Maudie would stay with Miss Stephanie for the time being. Anybody want some hot chocolate? He asked. I shuddered when Atticus started a fire in the stitching kitchen stove. As we drank our cocoa, I noticed Atticus looking at me, first with curiosity, then with anger. I thought I told you and Jem to stay foot put, he said. We did. We stayed. But whose blanket is that? Blanket? Yes, ma'am. Blanket. It isn't ours. I looked down and found myself clutching a brown woolen blanket. I was wearing around my shoulder, squaw fashion. Atticus, I don't know, sir. I turned to Jem for an answer, but Jem was even more bewildered than I. He said he didn't know how it got there. We did exactly as Atticus had told us. We stood down by the Radley Gate away from everybody. We didn't move an inch. Jem stopped. Mr. Nathan was at that fire, he babbled. I saw him. I saw him. He was tugging that mattress. Atticus, I swear. That's all right, son. Atticus grinned slowly. Looks like all of them was out tonight in one way or another. Jem, there's some wrapping paper in the pantry, I think. Go get it and we'll... Atticus, no, sir. Jem seemed to have lost his mind. He began pouring out our secrets right and left in total disregard for my safety, if not for his own, omitting nothing, not whole pants and all. Mr. Nathan put some men in that tree, Jem said. Mr. Nathan put some men in that tree, Atticus. And he did it to stop us finding things, Jem said. He's crazy, I reckon, like they say, Atticus, but I swear to God he ain't never harmed us. He ain't ever hurt us. He could have cut my throat from ear to ear that night, but he tried to mend my pants instead. He ain't ever hurt us, Atticus. Atticus said, whoa, son, so gently that I was greatly heartened. It was obvious that he had not followed a word Jem said, for all Atticus said was, you're right. We'd better keep this and the blanket to ourselves. Someday, maybe, Scout could thank him for covering her up. Thank who? I asked. Boo Radley. You were so busy looking at the fire, you didn't know it when he put the blanket around you. My stomach turned to water, and I nearly threw up when Jem held out the blanket and crept toward me. He sneaked out of the house, turned around, sneaked up, and went like this. Okay, so pause right here. There's three levels of understanding here. Um, Jem, so the fire. They're standing in front of the Radleys. There's only two people that live in that house, Nathan Radley and Arthur Radley. The mom is dead. That's it. Nathan Rad. Bradley was at the fire. That means that there's only one person left in that house. And Scout comes away with a blanket. 
So while they were watching the fire, he came, Boo Radley came up behind him and put the blanket on him. Now, as Jem is figuring this out, right? Jem is like, wait, he was there. There was the, like Jem, you can see him figuring it out. And then he's like, oh my God. And he goes through everything. He's like, my pants, he fixed them. And the things in the noddle and all of this stuff. And Scout is like, oh my God, shut up. We're going to get in trouble. And Atticus is smiling like, I've known this all along. Yes, obviously I knew you weren't playing strip poker. Yes, obviously. Yes, yes, yes. And Jem is like, come and clean. And Scout is like, oh my God, we're going to get in trouble. And then Jem gets through it all. And Scout's like, Atticus didn't even hear us. Atticus knew all along, dude, that you were not doing what you were supposed to be doing, but you were doing all of those things. So he just smiles when Jem figures it all out. And Scout's like, whoo, didn't even get it. Right over here. Whoo, didn't get it. Ah. Atticus <clears throat> said dryly, do not let this inspire you to further glory, Jeremy. Jem Scout, I ain't going to do anything to him. But I watched the fresh spark of venture uh, leave his eyes. Just think, Scout, he said. If you'd have just turned around, you'd have seen him. Calpurnia woke us up at noon. Atticus said we need not go to school that day. We'd learn nothing after no sleep. You should remember that. You learn nothing after no sleep. Go to bed early so you can sleep. Calpurnia said for us to try and clean up the front yard. Miss Maddie's sun hat was suspended in a thin layer of ice, like a fly in amber, and we had to dig under the dirt for her hedge clippers. We found her in the backyard, gazing at her frozen, charred azaleas. We're bringing back your things, Miss Maudie, said Jem. We're awful sorry. Miss Maudie looked around, and the shadow of her old grin crossed her face. I love Miss Maudie. Always wanted a smaller house, Jem Finch. Gives me more yard. Just think, I'll have more room for my azaleas now. You ain't grieving, Miss Maudie? I asked, surprised. Atticus said her house was nearly all she had. Grieving, child? Why? I hated that old cow bar, and I thought of setting fire to it a hundred times myself, except they'd lock me up. But don't you worry about me, Jean Louise. There are ways of doing things you don't know about. Why, I'll build me a little house and take a couple of rumors, tenants, rumors, and gracious, I'll have the finest yard in Alabama. Those belly grass will look plain puny when I get started. Jim and I looked at each other. How did it catch on fire, Miss Maudie? He asked. I don't know, Jim. Probably the chimney in the kitchen. I kept a fire in there last night for my potted plants. Here you had some unexpected company last night, Miss Jean Louise. How did you know? Atticus told me on his way to town this morning. Tell you the truth, I'd like to have been with you, and I'd have had sense enough to turn around. Miss Maudie puzzled me. With most of her possessions gone and her beloved yard in shambles, she still took a lively and cordial interest in Jem and mine affairs. Miss Maudie is like the most optimistic human ever. I love her. I think I am her a little bit. She must have seen my perplexity. She said, only thing I worried about last night was all the danger and commotion it caused. This whole neighborhood could have gone up in flames. Mr. Avery will be in bed for a week. He's right stove up. He's too old to do things like that. And I told him so. As soon as I get my hands clean, when Stephanie Crawford's not looking, I'll make him a lane cake. That Stephanie's been after my recipe for 30 years, and if she thinks she, I'll give it to her just because I'm staying with her, she's got another thing coming. I reflected that if Miss Maudie broke down and gave it to her, Miss Stephanie couldn't follow it anyway. Miss Maudie had once let me see it. Among other things, the recipe called for one large cup of sugar. It was, it was a still day. The air was so cold and clear, we heard the courthouse clock clank and rattle and strain before it struck the hour. Miss Maudie's nose was a color I had never seen before, and I inquired about it. I've been out here since six o'clock, she said. Should be frozen by now. She held up her hands. A network of tiny lines crisscrossed her palms, brown with dirt and dried blood. You've ruined them, said Jem. Why don't you get a colored man? Why don't you get some hired hand to do that? There was, a note of, there was no note of sacrifice in his voice when he added, Or scout at me. We can help you. Miss Maudie said, Thank you, sir, but you've got a job of your own over there. She pointed to our yard. You mean the snowman, the morphodite, I asked. Shoot, we can rake him up in a jiffy. Miss Maudie stared down at me, her lips moving silently. Suddenly, she put her hands to her head and whooped. When we left her, she was still chuckling. Jem said he didn't know what was the matter with her. That was just Miss Maudie. 
a long one. That is the end of chapter 8.